Okay. So I'll back. call people back in. We started taping? Mm -hmm. We're on. Yes, at the end. I'm hanging on that last word, though. <laughs> I'll hear about it in three hours. Three hours later. Which of the finance last night, they were showing last week's. I went, I went back and Bonnie and I had an argument. She says, I didn't see you at all. Where were you? <laughs> <laughs> what does she think you're out dating? Okay, we have already begun the regular school meeting of uh, the Arlington School Committee of Thursday, March 14th. Um, we've been having some technical difficulties with the TV feed and it's continuing. This may be taped, so whenever you see this, we have entered the meeting, gone immediately into executive session so we can conduct some business. We've now exited executive session and are returning to the start of our meeting. It's now 7.05 and we begin with public participation. Ms. Steinitz. Hi, I'm Rebecca, can you hear me? Am I right? Okay. I'm Rebecca Steinitz. I'm the president of the Arlington Education Foundation. Thank you for having me. And I'd like to share some spring news and an invitation from AEF. First of all, we're thrilled to announce a new grant program that we're starting this spring. The greatest treasure in Arlington schools is our teachers. And we wanted to thank them for their great teaching by giving them a chance to be students again. Our new Continuing Scholars Award, now I'm reading from the official language, will be awarded to full-time Arlington educators to support education experiences that will in turn benefit their students. The award will fund seminars, courses, workshops, trips, or expeditions sponsored by universities, schools, institutes, or professional development organizations. The grants go up to $2,500. We'll be awarding them in the spring and the fall. And people are asking, how many will you award? And um, we don't know. We want to see how many great applications we get, so we don't want to limit ourselves. Um, so the deadline for the first round of awards is April 1st, and the details can be found on our website, which is www.arlingtoneducationfoundationma, so you don't get Arlington, Virginia, <laughs> or Arlington, Tex Te Texas, dot org. Um, second, our Spring Innovations in Education grant deadline is April 15th. I'm sure you all know about these small grants for innovative school and classroom projects. Last fall, among other things, we funded training for world, world language teachers, a new statistics program at the Audison, and the Dallin Literary Journal. So we're looking forward to seeing what new ideas turn up this spring. We hope we'll be getting lots of grants. Um, Finally, I'd like to attend, and I'm, so, I'm sorry I don't have a B with me this year. My B is homesick. Um, I'd like to extend a formal invitation to the school committee, administrators, teachers, and families to join us at AEF's annual Trivia Bee. The Bee will take place Sunday, March 24th from 3 to 5 p.m. at Town Hall. Superintendent Bodie will once again be uh, Captain Gowned and serving as a judge and along with teams from all over town We have an, a great number of great teams this year We have teams from the Arlington Education Association the Pierce the Brackett the Stratton Two each from the Bishop and the high school and from either the hardest working school in Arlington or perhaps the most trivial school in Arlington <laughs> We have two teams from Hardy and one from the Hardy after school. So they're, they're serious down there in East Arlington. <laughs> now, I hear there's also a school committee team, but I believe you all need to get your paperwork in on time. I was just looking at our spreadsheet. Blank, blank lines for you all. Paul, and, um, who's your captain? Paul. I'm captain. You're captain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, glad I'm, I'm glad I'm here to help you clear up these personnel issues. Um, you'll also, Paul, you'll want a good name because you will be facing 
the high achievers. This is just the school teams. The sly ponders, <laughs> the Stratton smarties, the bracket boas, the Pierce Stingers, and my children's favorite, fight for your right to Hardy. <laughs> that has nothing to do with us. We've got creative people in this town. Um, there will be fierce competition, and the winner, the prize, is books for the school library of your choice. Um, there will also be children's activities. Uh, we're totally ramping up the activities this year. We've got um, a new school representative at AEF who I, like they start talking and I don't even know what they're talking about, but it's not just going to be stickers and crossword puzzles, um, building things and trivia and all sorts of stuff. Um, there'll be raffles, there'll be audience participation. I believe audience members are going to get to do the building challenges. Um, and there'll be refreshments. I brought the bee cookie cutter to Wilson Farms this morning, so the bee cookies will be there. <laughs> and this is all for the remarkable price of free. <laughs> so, um, again, visit our website to learn more, and we hope to see you all cheering on your favorite team at the Town Hall on Sunday, March 24th at 3 o'clock. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in and telling us about this. And we know Mr. Schlickman's going to get right. behind the... Up with a pithy name. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and that work? ends our public participation. At this point, we'll move on to Tools of the Mind. We apologize that you've had to wait. Dr. Bodie? Well, I don't know what Mr. Thielman may want to join me in this. We have been, this, this last two years, as you're well aware, and I think we've talked about this at the table several times, over the, the two years, in a pilot for a kindergarten curriculum called Tools of the Mind. And we've had uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Nico, who is here tonight, as well as uh, uh, some other people in the school, and, and Principal Zershikov, oh, thank you, are here tonight to answer questions. The, um, the issue before the committee tonight is to do a formal approval of this program. We've talked at, at community, the community uh, curriculum and, and accountability subcommittee about this. But there is, there's two parts to this, um, this evening's discussion. One is just to have an opportunity for questions. I know there's been some things over the last two weeks that, that some people have some questions about um, in the area of professional development. And in fact, that's the second reason uh, we wanted to have this as a separate item tonight to talk about some options for professional development um, assuming the, the positive vote of approval for this curriculum initiative. So I know that you've heard Mr. Miko before do a presentation on tools, quite eloquent one, I might add. But she's, she's here this evening to answer questions. And she also brought all of her, her kindergarten teachers from Hardy. And if they could all come up, um, one of the, and Deb, would you introduce everybody? Okay. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to um, answer questions. I have to tell you, I am so a very proud principal tonight because um, I had several days to think about coming here and I happened to be speaking with my teachers today and saying, you know, I know some questions are going to be coming up about specifically about the training and what that's about and I have not had a chance to go to the training. and. So my teacher said, well, we can give you the outlines of all the training sessions, but we wish we could be there. And I said, please come. So they are here with about four hours notice. They went out to dinner, had pizza. <laughs> um, so they are really the experts and very passionate about this. So um, I want to introduce Debbie Pielik, who's been at Hardy School for 10 years, Debbie? Um, and I've been there seven, so Deb was there when I got there, um, lucky for me. Uh, this is Erin Eldridge, who's been with us at Hardy for six years. She was at Thompson School for one year. So this is your eighth, seventh year? Seven. Seventh year. And Erica Dusam um, came on board, I think, Erica, you've been with us four years. Um, so, and they are just fabulous. So I'm happy to have them here, and we're happy to answer questions. Okay. Mr. Thuman, did you have anything you wanted to 
I just wanted to say the district did a two-year pilot um, that began 2010-2011 uh, school year, and we uh, had a committee subcommittee meeting uh, la earlier this week and had a good conversation with Dr. Bodhi about the curriculum, and by all accounts, uh, it's been well received by uh, kindergarten teachers. We heard from uh, Dr. Bodhi that uh, there are kindergarten teachers that do not, never want to go back to uh, the old curriculum, <laughs> including <laughs> all of you. And uh, it's, a, it's a curriculum that, that's designed to teach children uh, self-discipline, uh, the ability to organize themselves, and it, it gives them the skills they need to be better learners both in kindergarten and beyond. So uh, the, the, our subcommittee voted unanimously to recommend this curriculum, to, to uh, endorse this curriculum uh, to the full school committee and to have it uh, be adopted as the curriculum in kindergarten going forward, starting in September of 2013. Do we have any questions? Well, for <laughs> Ms. Starks. Um, how many uh, teachers have been trained and how many teachers would need to be trained? Uh, so at part of this, I'm sorry, is that for me? Whoever, Anybody? whoever can answer it. Um, so we have seven teachers who have been trained, correct? And um, we're thinking it's about 12 teachers in addition to that who would need to be trained. We have about 20 kindergarten teachers in the district. And they're all able to get this over the summer? Well, could you explain the training? And, and maybe sure. this would actually be a great opportunity for you to talk about the recent uh, day-long training you just went through. Right. So I'll just start by sort of giving you the, the big picture of the training. So um, training happens over two consecutive years for teachers who are adopting the tools program. The first year, uh, <laughs> there are two back-to-back -back training sessions that ideally happen the June before implementation. Um, and then through that first year, there are three additional full days of, of training. Um, and those have happened typically, I think they were October, January, March. The second year, those full day trainings continue, <coughs> and I believe there are four, with, the, with three again. So again, October, January, March. Okay. So those 12 teachers that need the training will get it. We have the ability to have that ready for them in June. So before they would leave, then they would be trained. Yes, ideally, that, that is, you want them back to back. I know our teachers who were in the pilot, um, we had to split it. They did one day in June and one day in just before school started, and that felt a little hectic. Um, so the, the design is to have it back to back. I want to talk about the, what the design what the design might be this summer. It's two day. It's two consecutive days. Right. And the issue is how to have two consecutive days for kindergarten. But I think this would be a great opportunity if, since you, you made the uh, the effort to come here. I think people who are listening would really like to know about this because I know that Mr. Thielman had an email wondering about the training. Is this another program? Is this a program that we're gonna we're going to have in the district <laughs> that people are going to move into without the support they need. I mean, it's a, it's a legitimate concern. And then another concern is what, do we, what evidence do we have over the last two years in mm -hmm. terms of student achievement? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, would you like to talk a little bit about the training and what it involves? Do you want to? Yeah. We can all check the training. Okay. So <laughs> um, I think what we really enjoyed the most about the training is that it's not just uh, curriculum driven, it's more philosophy driven. So right from the start, we, we learned so much about why we would do this curriculum and really what it would do for our whole classroom and for our whole idea about teaching. Um, our, whole I our whole way that we teach has completely changed and shifted. Um, and I think that once we had that, that found, that foundation, then that could really drive the curriculum that we were implementing. Um, so I, I feel like that was one of the biggest things about the, all the training that we received is it just put a complete twist on our overall idea of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I think 
did you want to yeah. no, you want to chime um, in? Yes, we actually just went to training yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, we're fortunate enough to meet um, Dr. Leong, who was the developer of the tools program. And just having her insight and having her there and being able to pick her brain about things, this was the most valuable professional development that I think we can say that we've ever done. Mm -hmm. And it's so extensive because it's so much information that if you were to get it all in one sitting, there's really no way to digest it. So year one is more um, the philosophy and then the content laid out in pieces. So you're not looking at September to June in one day. You're looking at you know chunks of time so that you're able to fully manage it and fully digest it. We've really enjoyed year two because now we can look back and say, oh yeah, I can see why that doesn't work or why we have to do it this way. So having year two as kind of a reflection mm -hmm. has been really great. Yesterday we could just sit through chaining. Oh, I know what she's talking about. Oh, I remember doing that. I still need to do this. Um, it was really, really valuable for us in that way. Do you want to add anything, Becky? Um, <laughs> to the microphone. Well, I know like this year we were saying um, when we were in the break room that it just has been really good to kind of like kind of do a lot more reflection this year and really think about, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. And then like you can really see a difference this year too, like having, you know, the second year around mm -hmm. with the kids, you can kind of to see it more, how it's you know affecting the kids and and how they're working together, so it's mm -hmm. it's been it's I just like the way it's been spread out too, mm -hmm. you know. Getting. And a lot of times I feel like in professional development we don't have a chance to go back and reflect on it. It's kind of like here you go, here's your curriculum, and good luck. We hope it works. But this year we've really been able to collaborate and collaborate across schools, collaborate across districts with other districts who are going through the same pilot program that we are, hearing what they've been doing, trying their ideas. So the part about teacher collaboration has been huge for us, I feel, too. And I'll just add one other part, uh, another piece of this professional development is um, the program also um, provides for coaching for teachers throughout the two year um, training span. So, uh, which is uh, it really the perfect professional development model because, in addition to having uh, the day to get information and the underpinning and the philosophy and the materials, you then have a coach who comes in on a regular basis both years and watches you teach and gives you feedback, models teaching for you, um, it, it really holds you kind of accountable for the fidelity of the program. Because as you know, whenever you uh, implement something, it, you want to make sure you're doing it the way it's intended to be because there's reasons for it being that way and you want to make sure you get the results that's, that is intended. Okay. Does, Ms. Tarks. Okay, um, so the, I assume then the cost, the training is part of the cost of the, the program, right? Because yes. that's a lot of, I assume, subs really for, so that they can do the PD as well as the training, right? Right. So then my question is, what is the cost and is it in the budget? <laughs> the cost is probably be about 50000 I think, for this first year. And we are going to be able to fund it through the new grant okay. that we have. Um, during the course of the year, um, we, we talked to the, the grant manager in DC to see if the tools program would be consistent with the, the, the guidelines and the criteria of the grant, and they agreed that it would be. So we amended our grant application, and that's how we're going to be funding this. I remember that there was a fifty thousand dollar item line item on the budget for tools. Is that is this fifty that you're talking about in addition to that fifty? No. So it's a hundred total, or it's it, the the source of the source of the revenue has changed not from the operating budget to a grant. Okay, Mr. Schlickman. So <clears throat> it looks like the heart of the program is combining self-regulation and with academic content. Uh, and there are, the question was raised uh, Tuesday or Monday night, I'm losing track of time, uh, regarding pacing and end of year attainment. And I think the comment was made that it's a little slower getting off the ground in September, but by this time of the year you're actually in a better spot. Uh, can you elaborate on that? So. That's very true, and when we start in September, the, it looks a lot different. Um, the, the children are 
um, involved in a lot of dramatic play and guided play. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of work around fairy tales and retelling of stories and children really learning how to get along with each other, work with partners, work with groups, um, problem solve. Um, they're learning how to regulate, how to wait their turn, um, but it's all through these activities <coughs> and um, games that the Tools of the Mind curriculum provides. Um, th there's, and you, through the trainings, you learn about why all of those games help that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second half of the year, it changes, and it, it, that's one of the things I think about the program is it's always changing. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't stay the same for mm -hmm. a whole year. It's c constantly changing and, and scaffolding up to, mm -hmm. with the children. Um, and then the second half of the year, it becomes very academic. Um, mm -hmm. But they're using all of those skills that they've learned earlier in the year, so they're more able to learn. So this is really infused in the total classroom routine mm -hmm. from the minute they walk in the door to the minute they leave. And it's an all, all day long. It's mm -hmm. in every activity that you do. Have, does this change in the way you're reporting to parents on, uh, on, on your children, uh, either through a report card or self-report uh, checklist or uh, something of that nature? I think, yeah, that's something that we were talking about, and I think that we're noticing a lot of things that the other curriculum didn't allow us to notice. Mm -hmm. So although not all of it is reflected in our report card, which will probably eventually need to be tweaked, mm -hmm. I feel like we're looking more at their interaction skills along with their academics, but we find those things equally as important. Mm -hmm. How can they interact? Can they wait their turn? How do they solve a problem with their friends? Um, do they need a lot of teacher scaffolding mm -hmm. still to do that? Or at this point in the year, can they do it independently? Mm -hmm. So, do you yeah. feel like? Mm -hmm. well, we actually have kept the report card. Yes. So we were still using the same report card mm -hmm. um, that everybody else was using and mm -hmm. like still able to, mm -hmm. to use it, which mm -hmm. I think, you know, for some parents that was comforting to mm -hmm. see that, you know, you're still doing, you know, pieces of what they were doing before, but just in a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask them if they would talk a little bit about the academics in terms of the benchmarks and where what you've what you've the data you've already looked at. So, um, and I believe you have an executive summary that I wrote um, <clears throat> that speaks a bit to the um, to the question about benchmarks. And we we were really committed as a district when we took this uh, study on mm -hmm. that our students in the tools study classrooms would be held to the same mm -hmm. benchmarks as the students across the district because mm -hmm. that is something that you as a committee and we as a district have committed ourselves to. And so we were really curious to see, we looked uh, particularly at the reading benchmarks at the end of the first year of tools implementation, which was last year. Now, granted, this was one year. So what we looked at was um, not just last year, but we looked at three, the two previous years as well. Because what we were hoping to see is, were there any trends? Did we see, did things pretty much stay the same? Were there some dramatic differences one way or the other? And what we discovered was there were really no dramatic differences in the data, that the way that the children had been um, achieving or reaching their benchmarks at the end of the year um, in those classrooms in the previous years were pretty much in concert with what we saw at the end of the last year. So at first we kind of thought, oh, but then we thought, oh, you know, we've really changed the way the day looks, we've changed the way the curriculum is rolled out, we've really committed to, as you heard Erica say, kind of ratcheting back at the beginning of the year and spending more time building children's ability to learn and remember on purpose um, and, and learn together and then roll out the academics, which is different from the way we've done it. And we gained all of that and nothing else changed. So. Um, I think that that was that was an important thing to 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 see. Um, I, I will say that one of the uh, tools teachers was remarking when she was looking at the data that she felt that the two, the the children who were ready in kindergarten to stretch beyond the benchmark to really be reading at a solid 
beginning, middle, even end of first grade, beginning second grade level, that she felt that there were more children who scored at that level um, because she felt that the richness of the curriculum gave them some place to stretch to. So that was just one teacher that remarked on that, and, and um, I just think it was an interesting, um, an interesting piece. So I don't know if there's more you want to hear or if that answered I, your question. Uh, Ms. Heim? Um, I had a question, and this may be for you or this may be for the superintendent. Um, a number of years ago, we committed to a lot of open circle training, mm -hmm. which is at the um, upper grades in elementary, though. And I'm wondering if that is still in place, how this program interacts with um, that and whether they're complementary whether that's still active or this is a transitioning in that we're expecting to see gradually feed up? Well, I'll answer sort of the administrative answer, then I'll, I'll let these guys um, take it from there. But um, to be part of the study, we were asked not to use open circle because um, there, that is a, a separate kind of social competence curriculum um, that, that is not part of how tools creates community and creates collaboration um, and creates problem solving skills so um, so right now tools uh, the tools classrooms have not been using open circle um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, how you you see tools sort of addressing those social interaction kinds of things and I don't know um, I mean, I think we're still addressing, like we're, it's, we're constantly working with the children on problem solving and, you know, they're constantly working with each other, um, talking out issues. So I think it feels very similar to the open circle. It's not as formal. Like with open circle, we, you know, we kind of met, you know, in a very, you know, formal way. Um, so this is, a, like, to me, very informal. Um, and I think, as Deb was saying, like, after the study, um, like I think this year now it's coming clear how we can take some of the things that we had been using and make them more tools like um, but but a lot of open circle is they definitely are very compatible it's mm -hmm. it's just a you know a little bit different way but um, I think it's yeah, still I, can, um, I found that in kindergarten open circle was great the language was great but the actual meeting part of open circle was really hard for kindergartners to sit through you know, a lot of talking, there's not a lot of props or anything to kind of engage them. So I found that part really challenging for Open Circle in kindergarten. But I feel like um, the tools, social stuff is just embedded in what we do. So it's more of just like in a natural moment because a lot of kids can walk the walk, but then they can't talk the talk when it comes to outside of Open Circle. So I feel like it's just more embedded into everything that we're doing and using that common language as well, which is great. Yeah, and they're yeah. always applying those skills to what they're doing yeah. for all these games and activities. Mm -hmm. yeah. A couple quick questions. Um, have you con has anyone consulted with the other kindergarten teachers in town, what they think, have they heard about it, what their thoughts are? Um, and, and, you know, Stephanie Zerchikoff is here, too. Um, her teachers were also part of the study, but they were the control group. They did not have the training. Um, so I would invite Stephanie to also say if she wants to, but it looks like she doesn't. Um, uh, Our team has really wanted, since jumping into this, since becoming involved, and we have been working with the teachers. I know. So I think, um, Judd, the answer to that is that any time there's going to be a major shift, um, you know, teachers are professionals, and they take a great deal of pride in what they do. And we have a very seasoned, very effective kindergarten staff here in Arlington, and it's hard, I believe, for teachers who are so professional to think about ooh, what am I going to need to change? What am I not going to be able to do? Um, so, and I'm sure that there are people who are all over the spectrum. I know that there are teachers who are, as Stephanie said, chomping at the bit. Let, just let me at it. Give me, you know, make the decision and train me. I'm ready to go. And then there are, are other teachers who are more skeptical. It's going to be a lot of work. What will it be like? And then there are teachers, I'm sure, who say, I really don't want to do this. I think any time you institute a change, that's the spectrum of, of what we have. But I also know um, that 
the, the teachers in Arlington are pros and they are willing when push comes to shove, when they're saying, you know, this is what needs to happen, they knuckle down, they figure it out, and they get involved. So I certainly don't, don't uh, intend to speak for all kindergarten teachers. I can't. Um, but I, I know from the meetings that we've had that, that, that people are anxious um, but uh, willing to try. Madam Chair, um, and I noticed that there were a couple of things that you found you would want to weave into a tools program. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because the comment about Open Circle, you said you were specifically prohibited from using Open Circle because it doesn't fit with their idea of. So I'm wondering to what extent can you weave things in to make the program better? And if you can, will that constrain the time you have in the day with these kindergartners? If you, if you start weaving more things in, what would have to come out? Um, so, I, I, I thought I knew what you were asking, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I know that... Um, For example, you say can, that, or, or this, this summary says that you would like to see certain issues addressed, such as the tools math program is weak, or yes. you'd like to weave in Arlington social studies and science curricula yes. into the tools program. Yes. What would then have to leave the tools program can, if those things were added? Can I make a point? I think, so you were in a study before yes. where you were actually being yes. quantified. So right. they had to follow certain right. rules because they were in a study. Okay. And they couldn't muck with, you know, they were sort of testing the tools curriculum. If right. they mucked with it, it right. wouldn't be a good study. I understand, but my, so my question. So going forward, what will be different? Sure. Um, so the, the, the Arlington's um, early math program is very compatible with tools. And it's, in fact, already the teachers who are in the study have been able, with the, the developer's sanction, take the uh, Arlington uh, math program and toolify it, create, make it, make it um, fit with the philosophy of the program, but keep the content rich, which is, was one of the concerns, that the, the math program that came to us through the tools was not strong enough. Um, social studies, I would, I, I, I would probably have to defer to my, my teachers. There really isn't a, a social studies curriculum per se, and Carrie Dunn and I have been working uh, to identify ways, ways that uh, the curriculum that she feels is important for kindergartners to have can be woven in. And in fact, one of the professional de development days that's left here in this school year, I believe it's in May, Carrie is meeting with um, the kindergarten teachers to talk about a new unit that she wants to put into kindergarten that, um, and some of the teachers who are here tonight will be working with her next year to um, implement that. Does that, does that answer your question, John? My, my last question, I'm sorry, That's okay. is, is the time element. Will there be, for, to, to add all these extra things that you see are not really as rich in the tools program, how, how will that be adjusted for, for so, our day? Sure. So just to be clear, the math is not an addition. It's almost like a substitution. So there still is math instruction. But instead of using the, the uh, units and the games that tools provides, we use the units and the activities that Arlington provides. And you just use it in that math time and in the way that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know about social studies, how th that will work or what would have to come out. Do you have anything to say about that? I think <coughs> A lot of it can be, a lot of the, the um, social studies curriculum that she's talking about with Carrie Dunn is that social curriculum that can be intertwined into our daily um, conversations that we have. Um, a lot of the tools, social studies type activities are about around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and where we do the Magic Treehouse series, all of those touch, there's a week with each book that is all nonfiction. Um, learning. It's all about, you know, right now it's space and we're learning about everything about outer space and traveling there and what the people use to travel there. Um, we did the Ice Age and the tools that they use in the Ice Age. and So a lot of that social studies curriculum can be intertwined in with those themes. Um, it's just being creative in how we, mm -hmm. how we do that. It wouldn't necessarily take more time. Mm -hmm. um, it would just be... Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm... Uh, aware of the time. I had one question and then I think we, if there's anything really burning, um, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the curriculum. We should be expecting some behavior changes in first grade. 
And that's what I'm really interested in and just wondering if you could speak to that. Um, as we, and again, this is just after one year, but one of the, in your summary that you have, um, some of the observations from the first grade teachers included um, that children, first of all, were much more um, willing to write. Writing is a huge component of, of the tools program, and it starts from day one. So what the, the um, first grade teachers across the board notice is that children were not afraid to write, that they were much more comfortable, competent, they had something to say, they knew how to use writing as a tool. Um, they noticed that children were able to solve conflicts without help. For example, I was in a first grade classroom and children were trying to figure out how to set up, how to get a game started. And in the past, what, what would have become uh, something that the teacher would have to intervene with, suddenly the children stopped and said, let's do rock, paper, scissors. Let's just kind of figure it out, and they did. Um, two, uh, first grade teachers noticed more collaborative learning. Children were more um, readily talking to each other about their learning, helping each other out if someone was stuck. Um, so these are the kinds of things that, that uh, we were seeing in first grade. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hainer? Really quick, is there any intent to provide upper grade teachers with reinforce, to reinforce these skills as the children go up? Uh, I assume you're not expecting these children to learn in the kindergarten <coughs> and maintain these things all the way through. Uh, I wish they could. Yeah, I actually wish they could do right. that. Um, we were talking to Dr. Leong yesterday, who is in the process of developing something for grades one through three. Mm -hmm. When that will happen and whether that's something that Arlington would adopt is. I, I guess I was thinking more of the idea of I, as a former fourth grade teacher, coming down and observe mm -hmm. the things so that when I see a potential conflict, and just might say from the other side of the room, uh, rock, paper, scissors. Mm -hmm and reinforce it like that. I don't know if that, that's part of it. Okay. So here's the, the tricky thing, and, and I know we don't have a lot of time. We could t obviously talk about this for a long time. But um, it's, it's really important for people to understand that um, the underpinning of this is really a philosophy. It's really understanding about teaching and learning. And so it isn't just a... Um, a question of, oh, that looks like a good idea. I'm going to do that in my third grade. It's not going to grow legs unless you really get, as these folks are saying, why this works and how does this shift not just how I do that, but how I do everything. So anyway. Okay. So at this point, um, thank you very much. And uh, take a vote on that. I thought we already had voted on this, but okay. No. We, no. No? Okay. okay. Not, mm -hmm. So I move that the Arlington Public Schools adopts the Tools of the Mind curriculum for all kindergarten classrooms commencing with the next, the 2013-2014 school year. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So, Okay, at this um, point, well, what you yeah. have at your place is, is you understand yellow that we, we need to have two days of training mm -hmm. uh, to begin this. And I put, this is really sort of a first read, three options. And during the next uh, two weeks, I'll actually survey parents and kindergarten teachers to what they prefer. But here they, essentially what they are. One possibility would be to just have the last day of kindergarten this year be Friday, the, June 21st. Option two would be to just have school, the, the students would stay to the last day of school, which is the 27th of June, but two of those days in the last week, either Monday, Tuesday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, they would have substitutes in their classroom. And they would not be their kindergarten TAs, I might add, because they're going to be part of the training as well. The third option would be a hybrid, and that would be that we, Parents who wanted their children to stay through the 27th could choose to do that, and we would have, for two of those days, substitutes in the classroom, or they could choose to have the last day be the 21st. Option one and three would require a school committee vote. So 
I, I'm just presenting this tonight as sort of the first read to think about it. I'll do a survey, let you know what comes of that, and then if we could at the 28th make a decision as what makes the most sense. Okay. Does anyone have any quick questions about the different options? Mr. Thielman. Do you have a preference? I mean, do you have a recommendation? What do you think is best pedagogically? Um, I think that the first option has the most, is the better of the, the three because it gives the teachers more professional development time. They would then use the other day and a half to work um, with, uh, them, among themselves in planning for next year. I would say, though, that there's probably a lot of parents who, who may not want, uh, have been counting on the last day of school to be the 27th of June, and that may not be uh, a, a great option for them to have it the, the school year end on the 21st. So it's the, the thing about the third option is the teachers would be back in the classroom the other days other than the training days. Does anyone else have any other quick questions? I have one, I just wanna ask. So all of these options would ensure the required number of school days for our kindergartners and our and hours? We're, we're so over the number of hours for kindergarten because we're a full day program and uh, the state only mandates a half day. Okay, okay, thank you. So we'll discuss this in two weeks. Um, so at this point, I wanna take a side uh, before we move on to the common formative assessments. And because the start of the meeting got messed up, um, I did not welcome our, our student rep, who is Lucas Munson, who is a senior. Um, he's the senior class vice president, and he also participates in soccer, basketball, volleyball, and a whole bunch of clubs. So I'm not gonna <laughs> go in there read through. But thank you for coming. We're sorry we had to move you out and back in. Um, and I also wanna, uh, Thank and welcome Ms. Foley for being our AEF representative this evening. Um, and also, I didn't get to read my quote. Uh, unlike as desired by Mr. Schlickman, I am not going to read the first 100 digits of pi. Um, <laughs> but uh, I found one that was about assessments, and it's from Douglas J. Etter, um, who says, if you don't know where you're headed, you'll probably end up somewhere else. <laughs> and with that, uh, there she is. <laughs> like we lost her. <laughs> um, yes. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Um, this evening, we're going to review where we are with our assessment program, and um, in order to do that, I always think um, that we should talk just a little bit about the importance of assessment. Um, and sort of touch base on their uh, major types of assessment. Talk about the current assessments that we have in place and what work lies ahead. In order to do that though, I always feel like an experient, experiential, having an experience is better than hearing it, it um, said at you. So uh, it, you sh could find in your packet, you have a um, packet of papers that says choose one of the next three do nows. So there are, it's a, white packet that was added to your place tonight because we didn't want anybody to cheat and get the answers ahead of time. So there are three do nows there. One is a math, one is um, a uh, physics one, and there is a humanities one. And if you would choose one of those to do in very quick order, please don't look at the person next to you. Um, and this is how many, many of our classes start every single day. These are examples of formative assessments. So if you would just choose one to do and I'll give you about two minutes to do it. Oh, and if you choose the physics one, we have a visual aid for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. That one's easy. Have about one more minute. Yeah, it would be the other way, but. No, no. The 
table's tilted. The table's tilted, but it's, just ro it's rolling off, so. Okay, if you would now turn to a person on your left or right and discuss which of the do nows that you chose and have a, a, about a 30 second discussion about why you chose it and what you think the answer is. Okay. I mean, I guess you could use the right. Okay, so how did you try to say that? Oh, it's just a No, it is. Yes. <laughs> Well, I no, think three hours the case. If I tie it and I pull it, what will happen? Can you pull it up over the top or under the top? About 10 seconds more. <laughs> okay, thank you. If I can bring everybody back. I know, it's very exciting. And this is why we start off our classes with it, to get students right to work as soon as they come in. Most teachers have these posted. Um, right on their boards when they come in and students begin to work on them. And we'll talk a little bit more about the um, purpose of these formative assessments in a moment. So assessment is a key part of curriculum and instruction assessment. It's the three-legged stool. Without one leg, it, the other two don't sort of work. Um, good assessment is critical in order to evaluate programs evaluate to assess student achievement and to help raise teacher quality. <coughs> Summative assessment helps us to evaluate the effectiveness of programs and curricula and that is the primary focus of summative assessment and when teachers join forces with their students in formative assessment the process that their partnership generates provides a powerful un outcome. We just did the do now. Um, this is a um, this one came from an eighth grade math class, just so you know. This uh, physics activity comes from our ninth grade physics classes, and it's based on Newton's second law of motion. And uh, this third one came from one of our English classes here at the high school. So formative assessment is assessment for learning. It provides teachers with information that will allow them to adopt changes in the instruction based on evidence and immediately get benefits to the student as part of the instruction process. Students can also, and this is a very key aspect of formative assessment, students can use evidence to actively manage and adjust their own learning. And tonight we heard about tools of the mind, and one of the key elements of tools of the mind is students creating their own learning plans and setting their own learning goals. Feedback in uh, assessment for learning occurs when there's still time to take action. Some of the assessment, um, and these are very simplistic definitions, but just sort of to make sure that we, everybody is sort of dealing with the same definitions, um, are, res, are results that are used to make some sort of judgment. Does this program work? Does this curricula work? Assessment of learning happens at some point in time. We draw, sort of draw a line in the sand and take an assessment at, as that point in time. And generally, the purpose is to measure the level of a student, a school, or program success. An overall assessment overview in Arlington. In terms of formative assessment, we use things like tickets to leave, um, uh, which is an, a formative assessment that's given at the end of the class, do nows, which is a formative assessment that's given at the beginning. We use DRA, which is a reading formative assessment, which informs teachers about their students' growth as they move along in the reading process, learning the reading process. Um, teacher observations can be used as a, a formative assessment. There may be a classroom performance tasks, and we have two online tools that we're currently using. One is called Play-Doh, and the other one's called Symphony to do um, formative assessment in uh, mathematics. In terms of summative assessment, and this is not an exhaustive list. These are some, just some um, examples. Uh, for summative assessment, we have unit and chapter tests and quizzes. We have culminating proje projects. MCAS access, which is the um, ELL assessment, and presentations and debates are other kinds of summative assessments. Mm -hmm. In your packet, you have um, both this uh, summary table and you also have detailed information in the um, salmon colored packet about all the res um, 
assessments that we do in Arlington. Um, if you look at this chart, you'll notice that there's a number of, uh, these are uh, assessments that are done commonly across all the grades. So while um, there are social studies as, um, assessments that are being done, I don't want don't mean to imply by this chart that there are no social studies assessments in the elementary schools, but they're not necessarily common, and that is one of the things we're going to be working on for next year. Um, and I want to now give you some ex specific examples of how we use information from our formative and com um, summative assessments at the elementary school and the upper grades. And so one of our formative assessments at the elementary school, as we talked about before, is DRA, and it measures accuracy, fluency, and comprehension in terms of reading. It will determine each student's instructional level um, and evaluates um, three components of reading, their reading engagement, their oral reading fluency, and comprehension. It will quickly help the teacher decide what the instructional needs are, and based on those <coughs> instructional needs, teachers can create a plan documenting uh, which uh, what each student needs to work on. And once the assessment is complete, the teachers can use this information to differentiate instruction and create instructional groups. And right now, this is happening within the classroom level, but it's our goal, and we'll talk again a little bit about this at the end, that we start to do that across a grade level when we look at that for next year. So that we um, look at, for example, uh, you know, grade two, and we look at where students are in the DRA, using the DRA in the process of acquiring reading skills, and that we may differentiate groups not between, not just one inside one classroom, but between multiple classrooms. Um, it's a true formative assessment. It is not a standardized assessment. Um, and there is some portion of this test that's subjective. And we don't calibrate that on a regular basis. Um, we will be creating some uh, new technology videos um, for teachers to watch and then uh, assess a student and then compare their assessment with the benchmark assessments that the reading specialists have put together. But right now, at once a teacher is trained, we rarely come back and calibrate it. And it's not meant to be a standardized assessment. It's meant to be a formative assessment. It's also used as a benchmark assessment to allow us to look at what percentage of students have reached the grade level benchmarks in oral reading fluency and comprehension at the mid-year point. Uh, an example of a s more summative type of assessment would be the fifth grade um, assessment where they take a common assessment in math um, at the mid-year point. It's aligned to the new state standards and each question is aligned to a specific standard. Uh, the new midterm covers all the standards that have been covered by the, at that point of the time in testing. And the results of the question are compared to the results of the same type of questions for MCAS. So this would be an example of an MCAS report um, that you would get from the state. This actually comes from Dallin. And I have put arrows next to a number of uh, standards. And you'll notice that, that we both have the 2000-2004 standards, which were the old standards before we adopted the Common Core, and the 2011 standards, which are the new Massachusetts State Framework standards. And I want to just call to your attention, you'll notice that there are a number of things there that don't have a corresponding standard, and that's because the standards they are changing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this would be the, um, the Excel spreadsheet that we would put student data in from the midterm assessment, and I've highlighted um, one of the standards that you saw from the previous that matches um, closely to the standards from the MCAS test. So it will give us some indication about how the students might be um, going to perform this year in the MCAS test because this is from last year's data and this is from this year's data. So it's not necessarily, but it gives us some predictive res results. In terms of secondary, um, these are, this is a summary table and again in your salmon packet you have all the detail of the um, assessments that we have at the secondary level. Uh, and you can see at each major subject area, these are the common assessments that we have at, those, uh, at each of those levels. And again, I want to take you through just very quickly a, specific, a couple of specific examples. So the sixth graders um, this year took a common assessment in math. Again, it is matched to the new state standards and each question is to a unique standard. The midterm covers all the standards that have been covered up to that point. And again, we're going to compare that data that we get from um, that uh, midterm exam to the MCAS from last year. So this would be an example of um, 
uh, the data that we got from the sixth grade from this year, and you'll see that I highlighted a specific standard. And then you can see how that relates to the MCAS standard. So one of the questions that the committee has asked was how, how do we connect it? Now in this case, we've connected it to the MCAS, but there will be other um, assessments that we will do that will actually create, get connected to the standard. And in some cases, those standards are more national standards. So for like world language, as you saw before, we have world language assessments, and those are being uh, checked against the national world language standards. Um, and then we have science uh, assessments that are happening, but we're going to have to probably look at modifying those because the new science standards are probably going to be um, uh, approved by the end of this school year. In ninth grade physics, we have a midterm exam that's based on former MCAS questions. And those responses are analyzed for trends. And then when we get to the pre-MCAS review, we modify um, that review based on the results of the midterm. But we also, I wanted to give in some examples of uh, formative assessments so that you know that we don't just do the standardized assessments. And the formative assessments in physics, we do do nows, as you, as you got to see one tonight. We do tickets to leave. We do quick writes. They're generally based on either that day's uh, topics or the previous night's topics. And it provides information to teachers on if it's necessary to change, modify, or reteach topics. So here is a do now activity for all you physics fans out there. And I actually have a physical model. So the question is, if you pull the string at the bottom and the weight wasn't moving, if I pull on the bottom thread gently but with increasing force, what will happen? Or if I pull it suddenly, what will happen? Would anybody like to say yes? Breaks. Which one? The top one will break. If I do what? If you pull it gently, no, if you pull it fast, the bottom one, the top one will break. Bottom one will break. <laughs> is that your final answer? What do you think? I think if you pull it fast, the top one will break. If you pull it slow, the bottom. Well, the correct answer, and I don't have time to go into the physics, nor would I have expertise in doing that, is that if you pull it fast, the bottom one will break. And we actually demonstrated this in my office this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And if you and if you want to know all the physics about this, just email lwetters at k12.ma.us. Um, if you pull it slowly, it actually creates tension in the top um, string and gives it time so that that string will break first. And it has to do that with the speed of which um, you pull the string. Um, and this would be something where students would have studied um, the second law of motion and then this demonstration, they would be asked to predict just like you were, and then they would actually do the demonstration and then they would be asked to explain their, de uh, their answer. The last thing I want to um, show you before we finish our, uh, I, we, then I take questions, is I would like to show you a variety of assessments that are happened in one um, kindergarten class in one week. And this is a video. We have a teach. We have a number of teachers um, that have used social media to uh, communicate to parents what their students. Um, outcomes have been on the assessments that have been in the class, and so. Uh, this is a very short video. It's only about two minutes and 52 seconds, and you'll see performance assessments. You'll see teacher observation, um, and you'll see a number of other assessments that are being used in the classroom. And I think this video is really telling because you'll see a combination of hands-on activities as well as technology being used to assess students.
loves Raz kids. How engaged they all are. I want to stop it right there. What you see right happening right now is that students are using styluses and they're writing, um, uh, this is a kindergarten class, so they're writing sentences about using iPads. And if you can see, and you'll see it better in the next video, you'll see that for each word, they make one line so that they're almost, di sort of almost diagramming the sentence. And so this is in, for, in kindergarten. That's the first step. The second step developmentally that the teacher is looking for is are they able to put the first sound of the word in? Then the next step developmentally would be like the last sound of the word and then the primary vowel sound of the word. So while it, you, know, you look at this and it looks very simplistic, the teacher is actually getting some very, very interesting information about what the students are able to do. So, and uh, the other thing I want to say about that last video is that was a student using Apple TV to show their individual work up on the um, screen. This is in Arlington? This is, yes, this is Stratton <laughs> Public School. <laughs> yes, this is a tools classroom. I didn't know we had iPads in any of the kindergartens. Um, these videos are actually made with conjunction by the students. All that, all the footage that you saw was taken by kindergarten students at um, in uh, Anne Marie Evans' class in the kindergarten at the Stratton School. And and I wanted to end with this video because I think you see a number of variety of assessments that we use every day in just a kindergarten class. And so I think sometimes there is a fear that when we add technology into a classroom, we're adding it for technology's sake. And I think that you can see in this video that when it's appropriate and it supports the educational process, we do use technology, but there's also lots of hands-on learning that comes in, um, in that classroom. Questions? Ms. Starks? Um, as far as the math assessments, um, is there any plan to expand uh, the math assess, assess, uh, common assessments to be other than just a mid-year? Uh, yeah, the next step would be, and I, I should have uh, actually talked about the next steps, um, the next step would be that we would um, take formative assessments that we could take along the way to make sure that that's going to happen. We're doing that with... Um, uh, with our Play-Doh system right now, but what you saw was um, uh, what you saw in the was the test. We need to make formative assessments along the way so that we can modify instruction, and that will be our next step. And we'll also have to modify it quite a bit because the new park assessment is going to be significantly different than the current MCAS assessment, and we'll and we'll have to be be having um, common uh, performance assessments to practice. So we'll be, we'll be putting those in next year. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Anyone else with questions? Okay, um, I guess I had one, which was part of what we were trying to do 
what the presentation was answered one of the uh, for the district goals, which is create, and I appreciate Mr. Pierce's iPad here, um, create or identify two common assessments at every level in all disciplines to measure student progress to, in order to maintain high expectations for learning, teacher consistency, and a common focus on instruction. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how we're doing for that. With the exception of elementary social studies, um, we have common assessments in every subject area um, across the across the K through 12 um, continuum. Um, in some cases, there's if you if you look at that salmon color chart, you'll see all the detail that's associated with that that I had passed out to the school committee. I think it's salmon, maybe beige. Um, beige. Uh, it talks about all the different assessments that we have, and um, sometimes it's three times a year. Some, sometimes there's five different assessments. It depends from subject to subject, but we are increasing those, and we are well aware that that's what we need to have in place um, to respond to the DESE in terms of uh, student district de determined student growth methods okay. measures. I okay. What that goal? We we've had common assessments for a long time. I think one of the things that we haven't had in place is using our, our common assessments as a tool for showing growth over small periods of time or even longer periods of time. And one of the big shifts this year is trying to use what we've even had while we create new ones to do exactly that. So in math, some of that really just comes from having a pretest so you can see where the growth is to the, the assessment. What this particular goal is referring to is something that's it's very much linked to the teacher educator evaluation system where we're going to have to have um, two measures of how to show student, uh, student growth and MCAS for people who actually um, have their ha students are tested will only be one of the two. So we, we need to do, to do this and, I, and, and across all, all curriculum areas. And uh, that has been the focus of a lot of our PLCs this year. Um, I think that we will have them in place by the fall, which was the goal. And certainly from the, there was a memo, and we'll talk more about this later, but there was a memo from the, the commissioner in February um, just laying out that this is something that school districts have to have in place in, in September. And, um, I, I'm not sure that we're going to phase it in in terms of the educator evaluation system uh, in all disciplines all next year, but it is definitely part of the new system. And so that's what that goal is really about, not creating more common assessments, but creating assessments that have a, 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 an intrinsic way of measuring growth over time. Okay. And it was also identified, but you're saying that we have at least two and some things in, have in the many major, more. In the major subject areas, okay. in the major subject areas. We're working currently, um, actually we have a professional development opportunity next week for music, art, teachers, um, fi, uh, PE and health are in good shape too. Those are not on that, uh, those are also on that, it's green, not salmon, I got the got wrong it. color, it's green. <laughs> and um, in, uh, in guidance, we also have common assessments. So the one area that I would say is probably get the most work to do in terms of there's not anything, but it's actually going to be the easiest is going to be um, uh, K through five social studies, and that's because um, of the work that they've been doing in social studies over the, the last couple of years. They just need to um, agree to what the common assessments are. Okay. Um, I guess the last thing I want to say is that, uh, as Dr. Bodie touched upon, um, we're going to be a need to. Um, really be able to analyze this data and capture all these data, this data in a common repository. And that's going to be particularly important as we try to work to six to eight week data teams for next year. And so we're looking at what the best way and the most expedient way would be to put um, that data together so that a teacher can actually look at the longitudinal information of their student prior to them coming to them. And so that by the time a student would get into middle school, we would have a, a a, a huge amount of data that teachers would be able to use to inform instruction with those speci specific students as well as their class. Any other questions? Mr. Thielman. We talked about this briefly in the subcommittee, but to what extent are teachers in different schools 
uh, using the common assessments to, to help each other improve as teachers, to improve their practice, to, to share best practices among teachers? Well, that is the work we've been doing in our PLCs this year. Um, I, we, for example, freed up um, six, seventh, and eighth grade math teachers by grade, not all at the same time. This year, um, for uh, four full days, where they took, created these assessments and then went back and looked at the data from these assessments. So there's been a, a fair amount of work that's associated with it, and um, we just get more and more of that happening all the time. And we're trying to really establish a formal way of doing that, particularly at the elementary school level, for next year. Okay. Anything else? No. Nope. Want to ask one of the two principals? <laughs> Put them on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> The superintendent wants you to come to the table. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to put you, but, but yeah. this is something that you see all the time going on in your schools, and I don't know if you'd like to uh, address that um, in terms of how teachers are using data in common planning time and, and, to, and to improve instruction. And, and to add to that question, is there any, in the elementary schools, are there chances for teachers from the third grade at one school to work with the teachers in the third grade at another school, or? or yeah, okay, so maybe talk about yeah. that, too. Um, well, I, I know that, as um, Dr. Bodie said, the professional learning community work that's, that is part of what all our teachers do um, is all about looking at formative assessments. So looking at a part of your practice, for example, mathematics, the, the third grade teachers would get together, take a look at what the data, what does the data show about where their children need um, extra help, and then creating an assessment or using an existing assessment to assess that, and then um, planning together how to address it across grades, across classes, and um, always looking at how the children are doing over a short period of time and then assessing again to see the growth. So um, that's something that we as principals encourage teachers to do, give them uh, faculty meeting time to devote to that kind of collaboration. So it is part of what teachers do. Um, and then what, what, we'll, what we will also do is um, at the at, at least twice a year at a faculty meeting have everyone share the results. And I particularly find the most rich conversations occur when it may not be the outcome that was expected. Then that really s stimulates the conversation. Mm -hmm. I know third grade this year, and why we're both remembering third grade, we, the, our, our staff took the, the Common Core language and their, you know, pre-assessment for the students, post-assessment. So it's really now become embedded, especially utilizing the PLCs. Across um, schools, we've done um, sharings, particularly at the end of the year in June, where all the third grade teachers will share their PLCs. Um, that was a very, we, I was only able to see one grade level, but that also, you know, stimulates conversation among the teachers. Thank you. Mr. Pierce? This is more about uh, emotional uh, feelings of the kids, especially the kids who are going to start like MCAS in third grade, for example. I mean, what, what do the principals have to say to the parents or the kids themselves, actually, in terms of managing stress? Stress is, you know, a, a big part of student life, and, and with, with increased assessments or added assessments, you might see an increase in, in well, some stress. Well, th some of these may not. MCAS, certainly, we know. The, the boys and girls feel it, and it, one of the things about th third grade is the big year to worry, and it, third grade happens to be a test that isn't particularly as rigorous as some of the other grade levels, so I think that helps the comfort level mm -hmm. of the boys and girls, but it does, you know, we, we talk about it, but we all, you know, we keep the, I know the teachers talk about it, and they try to prepare, and, you know, don't worry about it, but it's, it's a tricky um, there was something else in my head, and I was going to say just fell right in the floor, so I know she found it and picked it up. <laughs> I did. We also have a wonderful third grade teacher right here who could talk about this. Um, uh, but I, I, would, um, I would say, and, and Ms. Foley, you can correct me, um, that what I see is a very mindful um, sort, of, sort of rollout of what children should expect um, of the test starting fairly early in the year and I don't want 
people at home to think that all we do is prep for MCAS, but um, to do well on an MCAS test takes close reading, um, thoughtful reading, uh, the ability to, to express what you know in writing in a, in a legible and, and um, reasonable way, and that's just good teaching, and that's what happens all year long. As the test gets closer, it, it, it teachers, particularly uh, third grade teachers, because it's the first time, are mindful that the children are going to be looking at something very different, those little bubbles and all. So there's time spent preparing children to, to be ready to take the test. Um, and I don't know, Siobhan, if you want to, if you want me to put you on the spot, if there's anything <laughs> about that. Um, no, that's right. I mean, it's kind of a balancing act, really. You know, my kids in my classroom, the, the takeaway they have about MCAS is that they get two hours of recess that day. <laughs> um, and Yeah, and no homework. Um, so that's really their big takeaway from that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want them feeling like this is just something they can just, okay, if I don't want to answer it, I don't have to answer it. Um, so it is, you're, you're trying to kind of create that balance for them. Um, and I think I think over the years we've we've gotten much better with that, and um, the kids are I I find that the anxiety level of parents and children coming into third grade is much less um, these past few years than it had been when um, I first went into the classroom into third grade. Ms. Hoyer, um, I think you've done a very comprehensive job of letting us know how this data is being used to inform instruction and next steps. Um, the other component I wonder about is as you look at more and more pieces of formative data, when a student stands out apart from their class, so the class trending says we're in one place and a student is not in that same place, do you have the mechanisms in place to actually um, address those individual needs as well. Or have teacher assistant teams or charioters sort of we're seeing a trend, we'll, we'll bring the student up at a, a TAP and have a discussion and, and discuss strategies that will be tried in this way and tried in that way and then we move forward, come back in a few weeks and discuss how the progress has been. Am I hitting the right answer? I think so. I, I, th I, I also, I think I understand the, the concern, and teachers talk about this all the time, that when um, there's students who are not quite where you want them to be and everybody else is ready to move on, how do you create um, the time and the space for those children who need to catch up to catch up? Um, and there's a variety of ways to address that, including having one um, part of your math instruction, instructional time be devoted to small group work. So, so children are working at stations that are um, having them practice uh, new learning while the teacher takes aside. It's very much like a reading time where the teacher will take aside those children who need to shore up those skills. Um, it's very hard to, to know what, how to slow things down um, and, and um, and yet still reach the content uh, that, that is expected. And I don't know, again, Siobhan, if you want to say. I, I think you were also kind of asking about the other end of the spectrum of children who are exceeding expectations. Okay. Um, I can only speak about my classroom and probably some of my colleagues, but um, we do, like for our reading program, for example, the children are... Um, Expect I have an expectation that they are reading every single night, and I am recording on a um, paper every morning um, how many what book they are reading and how many pages they read that night, and that is kind of individualized. That's differentiated for every child. So <coughs> there will be kids who will tell me in third grade that they are reading Harry Potter um, and that they read you know 50 pages that night. And if this is the fifth or sixth time I've heard that they are reading Harry Potter and that they read 50 pages, I'm not going to be impressed anymore. Um, it's going to be a conversation of, let's move you on. How about trying some, uh, some nonfiction, um, breaking you out of your genre level? So I think at the elementary level, 
I can say that for children who are, and we're also um, slowly incorporating more in math, for example, more pre-assessments to get a better um, sense of children who will already understand what it is we're doing. And then we're hopefully going to be creating more extension type of um, projects and things in that math unit that children who have exceed, who already understand what the basic curriculum is for that unit, that they will be able to extend it and go a little further on it. But I have a feeling with our new math curriculum, that's probably a little bit down the road. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Was there anything else you want to? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. At this point, we will move on to the budget. Okay. Thank you. So, first, Ms. Johnson, do you want to update us on the packet that you gave us? Mm -hmm. um, yes. The packet that you received um, with your usual delivery mm -hmm. um, had an updated. Uh, pie chart as suggested by Mr. Schlickman um, in Pac-Man yellow. I thought that was a nice beautiful color. You all, ha yep, it's on top. I see at least some of them. Yep. And that, I used the estimated chapter 70 from the um, Department of, from the Department of Education website. I did not use the estimated chapter 70 that's been folded into the multi-year plan for the town because I just thought that was a nice clean sourced number and I just used that. And uh, the green is that number from the Department of Ed website and the yellow is the difference between the entire town appropriation and the Chapter 70 funds. I also updated the um, budget transfer summary. As uh, Mr. Um, Hainer discovered there was an error in the way the bus driver salaries had been, um, in fact, their program code. So when I corrected that, because the um, line items in the budget transfer are based on program codes, I had to make that shift. So all of the doc, and I found one other error when I was fixing that error, which had to do with an object code being incorrect in visual and performing arts. So I made those two corrections. And so I've, I've given you fresh sheets on everything that was affected by those two changes. There's been no curricular changes. There's no been changes of strategy. They were just budget code errors that I've corrected. Mm -hmm. So you have a new revised budget transfer summary. Mm -hmm. The cost center summary did not change. The program summary did change because of that error with the bus drivers. The object summary changed because of the error with visual and performing arts. And the um, special ed summary changed because of the bus drivers. They had been booked the wrong way. So they did not appear in the initial special ed summary, but they do appear in this one. So those are the revised sheets, and they all say revised at the top. Mm -hmm. And then I added a new sheet um, with the um, requested facilities assessment, and it, I did it similarly to the way I did the special ed pullout and the athletics pullout. The difference was that the main organizational um, budget code in this case was the object because the object is really what unifies the type of spending in facilities. Whether it's, a, to take an example on page one of eight, uh, plumbing services. As you see for FY14 level service and the FY14 proposed budget, mm -hmm. the $55,000 resides in the facilities um, cost center 75 line, but the expenditures are all out in the actual physical buildings. And you can see correctly that, you know, in this particular example, uh, Thompson cost center 24 has no expenses after FY11, which is when we shut the building. And if we saw expenses in FY12 and 13, that would obviously be a problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that works well. Um, so that's why it's different. Typically my, my method is cost center, program, and object. But when I did facilities that way, it didn't bring us to what we wanted to see. And in facilities, the driver's really the object. What is it? Plumbing services, elevator services, and all the other myriad of tasks that are necessary to keep a building running. So those are the, the new forms that you got ahead of time. And then you also got this on your chairs tonight. This is the multi-year special education summary, um, and I apologize for how tiny it's getting. 
At some point, I'm going to have to stop lop, start lopping off years, but I think it's really important to see the breadth of time on this spreadsheet because there was a, a huge change from FY05, which is the first year when we had 176 students in out-of-district placements. And over time, we've gone up and down, but we've settled around 100. And that's a pretty significant change. And you know, when printing forces me to get rid of FY05, we're going to lose that. And I wasn't ready to give it up yet. <laughs> but we see nine years of data. It, there's actual data through FY12, and it is the 13 budget um, in the final column. And what, what I'd like to point out, and all, there's lots of information on the sheet, and again, I apologize for it being so tiny. What I'd like to point out most especially is that special ed doesn't, costs don't rise in a linear fashion. They go up a lot, they drop off precipitously, they bounce all over the place. But the average of this run rate over time is about 8.22%, well, it is 8.22% across these nine years. So that, that's really what I'd like you to take away from this spreadsheet. Um, Where is that? Okay. Well, it's nowhere. And as I'm saying that, I'm like, duh, if that was the main point, why isn't it on the spreadsheet oh, somewhere? Okay. <laughs> Mostly because now that I, you know, now they think about it, where would I, where would I have put that information? Um, so that's know, there's the so average. many things jammed in here already. But if you look, you know, it's 14%, 10%, 12%, 3%, 5%, negative 11%, 16%, 10%. Which works out to 8.22. One thing that um, I was thinking about when we were first talking about the spreadsheet and the results of the spreadsheet, a similar one was done a couple of years ago, and that started back really in the two, the beginning part of, uh, I think probably earlier than 05. But what we had seen was a rate of growth, something more like 10%. And so what we're seeing, while we're still not down at 7% um, and lower, <coughs> we are certainly seeing a trend by the type of programming that we are doing um, in district is having a very noticeable effect in terms of the rate of growth, even though we're still seeing these fluctuations. And I think that's a really important piece of it. So if we were you know, five years out, Maybe we will be seeing, uh, you know, even a even a smaller um, average over time. Okay. Um, do you have anything else you want to add at this point about the budget? Um, <coughs> no. Okay. 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 Mr. Thielman? can we just get a clarification? I'm trying to remember exactly the language about how this the the, the special education spending increases. Uh, uh, ties into the five-year plan, what the, the, the limits are. Could you just refresh? Sure. Um, the multi-year plan, which I didn't make a copy for all of you, but this is the multi-year plan that I think many or most of you are familiar with, is projecting that general edu the, the town share of our costs at the time of the override were determined at the time of the override. And there's general education costs and special education costs. Even at that time, that special education cost factor at the town did not represent 100% of our special ed spending. It is a portion of it, it just like the Pac-Man pie. There's a piece of it that doesn't come from the town. And so that skews everything a little bit. But the decision was made at the time of the override based on the data we had presented over and over that special education just could not be managed at a 3.5% growth rate based on past history. The decision was made that the portion that was set aside as special ed money would grow at up to 7%, and the other portion would grow at 3.5%. At this point, given the projections of the multi-year plan, the assumption is, is that base from the time of the override will continue to, this portion that's been designated as Fed will continue to grow at 7% year over year, and the portion that was designated as general ed would continue to grow at 3.5 year over year. We've since layered in the kindergarten fee offset, which is not growing year over year because we generally do not raise our fees year over year. So we're just getting a flat offset for that amount of money. And that is the expectation. The 15286448, which is the special education portion of FY14, is not, does not represent 100% of our spending in special education. We're spending well in excess of that. 
Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, are there other questions about the budget? I have one. Um, now I have to find my question again. There it is. Okay, so I was looking at the new charts and I appreciate doing the facilities summary because it leads me to ask again, where's the Thompson heat? Um, the heat I'm just, isn't is it, broken out school by school and never has been. Right, no, I, I understand that, but is it natural gas or is it electric? It'll be both. Both. Okay. It's, it's a gas-based heating system, but there will be, util there will be electricity in it. Right, but what I'm saying is the FY13 expense projections are the FY14 level service, and we've got a whole other building coming online, so I'm confused. Well, and, and that, that's I what I mean not, by where is the Thompson heat. I, I, it's would, like, I, don't I would not put a tremendous amount of weight on the projections. Okay. You know, the projections were made at mid-year, at the beginning of, essentially the beginning of the winter heating season. So. Okay. What I'm trying to say is it seems like the amount uh, estimated for FY14 for gas at least is low. Well, if you look at the actuals, and I think here's where you tell the story. If you look at natural gas, to take mm -hmm. that as an example, in FY11 with the old Thompson functional, we spent 645, 975. But it was heated with oil. Not entirely. Okay. There, there was also gas involved in that school. In FY12, um, we dropped off to 508 for our gas bill. So absent the Thompson, we were only spending 508. We have a budget for 13 of 696, and in my usual hyper-conservatism, I'm projecting something pretty close to that for this year because that's what I'm always going to do. But I think the real tell here is the 508, and the difference between the prior year and the 508 is where the Thompson heat comes back in. But FY12 was a really warm year, right? It was. Yeah. But so there's not no money there. Okay, I'm, I guess I will hope that your ups and downs all even out, but that, that was my concern is that I didn't see a, an up chunk in the heat. Um, so nobody else has any other questions about, okay, so at this point, I think we are, or statements or anything to make about the budget, no. Don't make a motion to move. I think what we've done before is do it by we go to section four yeah, we, oh. to the revised budget summary. Please, we vote eight. these. Oh yeah. And we vote the, um, the we, large. Do we just items. vote the buckets? Because I thought we voted the. We did it by chunks before. Was we did that, it by buckets. Did it by buckets. Did it just by buckets? Okay. It's it's the it's the budget transfer summary that we okay. vote line by line. Tell me where I am. It, it's uh, section four. <laughs> Page one. I know it's just. I believe it's a section right under the package. First page after the blue, after you handed out. Yes. Cindy found it. I I don't want to take. Sorry, I took them all out of the blue and put them in my binder. So. I like having the change. Budget transfer summary. That's all I needed it. And it says revised. So we're just so we're approving the proposed budget, the second to last column. Just the blue. Yes. Line by line, elementary. So I move secondary. approval of the elementary budget of twelve million three hundred twenty-one thousand six hundred thirty-one dollars for FY fourteen. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I move approval of the secondary budget of twelve million two hundred fifty-eight thousand nine hundred twenty-three dollars for Second. FY fourteen. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any any. Against? No. I move approval of the special education budget of $16,017,799 for FY14. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I move approval of the curriculum and instruction total budget of $1,362,709 for FY14. Second. Any discussion? Aye. All, in, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I move approval of the administration total of $2,555,302 for FY14. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
I move approval of the other total facilities, IT and transportation of $5,936,783 for FY14. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Move approval. Of the, so you want the should we do we approve the total? No. And so just the grants it. total, though. And, okay. and you did the approval back in January of the total town appropriation, which I need for the end of the year report. So I think we're good. That's we're it. done. You're okay. We're done. You're legal. The budget is done. Thank for you. now. Now it goes to town meeting. Now it goes to town meeting. Well, so FinCom Wednesday night. I hope you'll all be there. Mm -hmm. 7:30. When is the night? Is that next? 7:45. Wednesday. It's coming Wednesday. The 20th. Yes. 20th. Okay. Next Wednesday. Time what? Time change. Time change. What's that? What's the time? 7.45. 7.45, I'm 745. sorry. 7.45, Wednesday night, the 20th, at Town Hall in the Selectman's Hearing Room. Sorry, I have to write. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you very much for that. And at this point, we move on to the coordinated finance stakeholder group update. Ms. Johnson. Um, yes, I, um, I've been serving on this committee since it started over the summer. And the group um, developed, um, had some really wonderful conversations and has developed a proposal um, to develop a governance structure on the town side that we feel will facilitate efficiency, um, good service delivery, cost containment, and um, basically help Arlington to grow into the future in a, in a positive way. This proposal was brought to an open meeting, um, and I can't remember exactly when, and last night was brought to the Finance Committee um, where it did not pass, there was a split decision, um, but it was not was not forwarded by the Finance Committee. And the group is going to uh, regroup and um, continue our discussions along this line. I should mention that the decision was made by the group as a whole that the discussion of consolidation, which people immediately leap to the conclusion is a consolidation between town and school, can't even really have a rational discussion until the town goes through a consolidation process. As um, Town Manager Chapdelaine said last night in front of the Finance Committee, the schools have a consolidated finance department. <laughs> the town does not. And so you can't merge something to nothing. You know, that there's too many moving parts on the town side for any kind of dis rational discussion about a, a, a merger to take place. So really, the school's part of this is very much on the back burner. I'm in the discussions as a person who deals with financial issues on a daily basis, I interact with all the other people on this committee regularly, and my presence in the committee has been really helpful in terms of opening up communications about efficiencies and accounts receivable, or you know, how should we deal with this, or we're gonna do munis training, or what if we tried this this way. It's really been a positive group, and I think it speaks to a really necessary step that all of these departments begin working together. Also, as an outcome of this committee is a decision to do hiring um, in financial related positions in a different way so that all the members in the stakeholder group would have some involvement. And consequently, I was on the interview team for the budget analyst position at Town Hall um, and spent a day um, seeing their candidate, their finalists <coughs> and being part of the team that evaluated. Um, one of the, they put them through a very grueling process and one of the one of the things they asked them to do was to do a spreadsheet. They were given a task to say, you need to do a spreadsheet to explain this data to a stakeholder group. So go, here's a computer, knock us out a spreadsheet and bring it back. And I don't know whether it was nerves or what, but of the five finalists, three of them had substantive mathematical errors in their spreadsheets, which I'm <laughs> sure they walked out later and went, no. <laughs> um, but those kinds of things are telling because in this kind of work, you're under the gun and those kinds of mistakes in a spreadsheet are death on the floor. And so it was really important when we were vetting candidates that we find somebody who, if they made those kind of boo-boos, would catch them before they, they came out. So um, the personnel director on the town side is very clever with coming up with some high pressure scenarios. They, they also had to interview someone who uh, had a disgruntled town member in their face. Basically, it was a role play scenario and it was interesting to see how the candidates responded to that. I'm really glad I didn't have to go through that kind of an interview process. <laughs> I'm sure I would have folded like a deck of cards. Just <laughs> 
So um, that, that hiring process, I think, has a lot of potential for all of us. You know, when the, the, my position is traditionally hired, it's really very much a school committee, school department hire. But I interact with the finance people all the time. And so it makes a lot of sense that the comptroller, the town manager, the treasurer, and all those people, that we all are sort of involved. Because we're all going to have to play together like a team. So I think that's one of the really excellent recommendations that was part of this proposal. And I hope, no matter what happens at town meeting, I hope that can, can happen in an informal, if not a more formalized way. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hainer? I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, my concern about this whole issue and, and, and what's going on is that this has been, as of right now, a two-year, current two-year process in dealing with the consolidated finance beginning in 2011 with Article 51 that was not acted on for almost another 14 months, establishing this, uh, the group that uh, Ms. Johnson was just talking about. Um, I think part of the communication in, in I think it's most important when one of our employees is involved with other aspects of the town that we get a regular update of what's going on just so that we're aware and we're not caught short. Um, even if there's nothing else, if nothing happened, the last couple of meetings, we do that ourselves in our subcommittee meetings. If we haven't had a subcommittee, we just said nothing's gone on and we move on. The other thing, and I'm not sure if this, people are aware of it, and I apologize, I don't mean to talk down to anyone, but the town itself in town meeting has only one charge over us, the school department. They set our budget. They cannot direct us and require us to do anything that we choose not to do. They can hold up our budget if they chose, uh, but that is it. So in, in the charge in, from Article 51 was that the town meeting hereby requests the town manager to research the consolidate input from, I'm cutting some parts out, the selectmen, the school committee, superintendent, the finance committee. It goes on. I will stand corrected, but <coughs> I was just on the committee just prior to the town meeting. I came board, on board two years ago. I do not remember us as a committee having input other than when the DOR report came last year. We had concerns about it, what they were suggesting. If that was our, our input, I haven't seen it uh, uh, formalized anywhere. I just want us that. Okay, Ms. Heim? Um, I, and the chair and others can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought we had drafted a committee letter to the town stating our position on that. Um, on the we, DOR. I, I, and I, we also were actually, involved. Actually, but it was, it was solicited as, as input, and we cited the DOR, but that was, a, yeah. my understanding, our formal input. But that, that's one year after the request for input. And that's when we were asked for that's input. Article 51 was in 2011. The okay. DOI report did not come on to it. Okay. I don't want to quibble yeah. on this. My yeah, major I concern is communication, that when we have uh, a superintendent or designee or whatever interacting with other agencies in town, I just want to be kept updated. And I don't think that, that has happened. I don't see that as a, it, it was done maliciously or intentionally okay. or anything. That's all. Okay, I think Mr. Hainer's communicated his concern. I would counter that. Oh, sorry, Ms. Johnson. May I ask a clarifying question? Sure. sure. Um, you said when members of the school department have interaction with other agencies in the town, I talk to the comptroller, the deputy town manager, very frequently. Are you, you mean more formalized I, bodies or committees or something like my that? My understanding, it's, it's been explained to me that your position on this uh, group, the consolidated uh, group, was mandated, the word required, out of Article 51. It was, it, they can't require it. They can request it, and that's what the article said. I'm responding to a question. Yeah. Uh, this, when, when a member of our organization is representing the school in that kind of a, a situation, a request or being part of a board or something like that. I'd just like to be kept updated when it reflects on us. Okay. Because this, yeah. this particular thing may in the future or has in the past reflected on us. Okay. Mr. Pierce. A couple quick questions. I'm not sure if this is on, on topic or on time right now, but it has to do with the monthly reporting? No, or let's, let's finish okay. this. Okay, does any, Mr. Schlickman, but keep it brief, I'm trying to 
Well, uh, the question is, is that uh, if you can give us a synopsis of uh, the Finance Committee's thinking when they d uh, were divided and did not go for this. Uh, the, the reasons against it mm -hmm. were incredibly diverse and numerous. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of at least, off the top of my head, I can think of almost five or six different positions against it mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with each other. The people that were for it felt that um, unified accountability mm -hmm. would improve operational efficiency and that some of these positions aren't, that we're talking about bringing under the town manager aren't positions that the electorate is really in a position to evaluate their performance, mm -hmm. yay or nay, and that, that there's been a tradition of, as the town manager characterizes it, silos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and operationally it creates some weirdness. I mean, I can say from my personal experience, Munis, our financial system for both town and school, is owned by the comptroller. And so she makes the majority of the decisions regarding Munis when it gets upgraded. And, you know, this year I, I stepped in and said, you know, we really have to get more training for the school staff. That's never traditionally been done because the comptroller's department owns Munis, and so they wouldn't think to train the school department. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just one of that sort of, you know, it's not malicious, mm -hmm. but, you know, the comptroller's charged with certain responsibilities, the financial software is her responsibility, and she's thinking about what she needs to get done. It limits lateral thinking is fundamentally the problem. Uh, how, how, split, I, how split I, was the finance I, committee? Five to 13. Oh, okay. no action. I think, yeah. yeah was, I think this is going recorded. kind of far afield. I brought this up to give a report, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that Ms. Johnson has been, um, so the only thing I would say is, is just to counter Mr. Hayner's position, I would say that it's also, I think, a reasonable thought that the superintendent is in charge of this, is supervising the CFO and is the one who should be keeping track. And I'm not saying we have to come up, we're not gonna have this discussion right now. Um, but I just want to say it's a, I'm not, I allowed you to give your point of view. That. I'm giving a separate point of view and we're gonna put this issue to rest now. And because it wasn't. Thompson rebuild report. <laughs> Actually, we're gonna do the uh, tracking report, except we didn't get it until just now. So you yeah, had a quick I, question. I, which I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to. I was going to put it on next month or next week, but I, did you oh, okay. Yeah, I was just skimming it uh, a little bit, and I I have a couple of quick questions. Um, when you look on page um, three of three. Um, Object 87601, court judgments, damage, settlement, right? It's mm -hmm. Just as an example. Yes. Um, I'm still projecting that we're going to spend the whole thing, even though that's highly unlikely at this point in the year. Right. That was my question. And that's my answer. Okay. I'm okay. still projecting, and you'll notice mo all of these where we're still estimating to budget. Yeah. I'm still going with the expectation that that money could disappear between now and June. And what happens if it doesn't? Then that will be part of the, the year-end balances right. that will that last year helped to fund our uh, wireless infrastructure by the app, the iPad carts for various schools. I mean that those become. Do, we, do the, does the school committee see a plan of if we are fortunate enough to realize? Do we see like a, a priority sheet as yes, to? Yes, we made that. We made that. We did that. We okay. That a couple the weeks last ago. the other question I have is, is sometimes you say estimating. Um, to budget when it could be estimating under. Is that well, kind of getting the same I'm still answer? carrying it to budget at this point because okay. I think there are too many unknowns to say for sure. I mean, with settlements, as you know, something could settle like that and boom, the money's gone and it may not be on my horizon. So that's the kind of thing I would hold on to. Also, um, instructional materials and textbooks. My assumption is that every penny will be expended. Right. You know, and, and so I am pr thus projecting, even though if we went on a run rate projection, mm -hmm. it's likely we would have savings there. But I'm assuming that we have <laughs> needs in these areas and we will spend it all. And, and that's basically the differentiation that I make. You know, if I think there's a reasonable run rate, like at this point in the year, I'm lowering my projections on things like HVAC repairs, mm -hmm. because we're coming to the end of the heating season. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten them working, they're running now. That's the kind of expense that front loads in when the heat comes on. So those I tail off on. But something like textbooks, I'm going to assume that we're going to, we're going to buy every penny's worth. And so I'm projecting that to budget. And are, 
Last question. Are you concerned about the variances for things like salaries and temp salaries, which are estimating highly above budget? No, page one. I, I'm not, because there's, there's savings in other areas. Okay. Thank you. And, you know, again, the, the, um, the budget transfer detail that we voted, mm -hmm. I mean, those lines are, are quite thoughtful, mm -hmm. so that the variance stays within the line. You know, typically, you know, we, I expect to see savings in facilities this year if we don't get another nasty snowstorm or two. And so, but that's also where the line for IT is. And so I don't need to come to you and ask for a transfer because it's the same budget line. So if I'm not spending it on heat and I am spending it on computers, it's still the same budget line. But legal and computers wouldn't be in the same line? No, legal would be in, um, I believe, as an administration. Okay. Okay. So we will bring this up and see if anyone else has any questions next meeting because we didn't get this soon enough. So at this point, we have update on the Thompson rebuild. Well, there's not much more to report than I did the last time. Um, we have had, um, we have monthly meetings. Um, this last month, the town manager and I and um, Karen Tassoni and Dominic Lanzilata, we went on a tour of, of Thompson just to see, and I, I told you that at the last meeting, and we were talking about having, you have an opportunity to do a tour. In fact, we're also going to invite the whole Thompson School Building Committee to take one. And the uh, recommendation from our project manager is to wait to sometime in April. It, it, you're still at this point on, in some of the floors sort of having to watch where you're walking and it's one thing to take a couple of <coughs> people in there, it's another thing to take a, a big, uh, a fairly larger group. But so we're going to look at some time in April to, to do that. Um, so at this point, it's, it's, it's um, going along fine. We have um, already submitted, I think we're in the stage where we're putting the, uh, we don't really have to do bids on the IT only because everything, pretty much everything we're going to buy is off the state contract. Whereas with furniture, we've had to put the bids out, and I believe those bids are going to probably come in another week or two. Is that when they're coming in? I believe the expectation was we would have bid results in time for the April meeting. Yeah. And, and th this was all timelined out so that we could have the furniture um, probably start to be delivered sometime in July. You ha we're probably about two weeks off the schedule at this point, and a lot of it has to do with a mechanics. And the mechanics are the, there was a slowdown in delivering, for example, the boilers. When we went through the walkthrough, the, um, the, the water heater was there, but the boiler wasn't, and there has been a slowdown in getting it. So that has a, has a um, uh, domino effect in some things. But even with a two-week probably um, delay overall, we are still, as John Cole, who is the chair of the, the Permanent Town Building Committee, has said, we are so far ahead in terms of when the completion date is compared to any other project we've ever done in Arlington. So he's not a, a, a concern whatsoever, and he has that historical perspective on it. So right now, um, <coughs> furniture will be start to be delivered. Um, the substantial completion, which is the most important date, they actually still have at the end of June. It may slip a little bit into July, but we'll probably have a better idea at the next meeting. And it's going forward. And uh, I just sort of happened to run into a neighbor of the of the uh, that was living right around the corner and she just commented to me how beautiful she thought it was so it, it is going to be a very lovely building and certainly very beautiful inside and and Siobhan's going to get to be be one of the first uh mm -hmm. first grades in there yep can't wait yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> great thank you very much um and now superintendent report all right um i have a, a few things and a lot of uh but this is more informational. We, we did have a difficult day last Friday, and I uh, shared with you the, the email I sent out to parents. But I, the, the, I don't really want to go through tonight all of the reasoning of what happened last week. I think that, that there was, um, I'm not sure that we could have, I think the only way we would have been able to not have had school would have been to have to delay, but there was no indication that a delay was needed at the time we had to make the decision. 
But what I really wanted to say tonight was again reiterating that should we have another storm, that parents really do need to make that decision. And it is an excused absence if, this, if you just can't get there. So um, we overall, though, had relatively good attendance, mm -hmm. both for staff and for students. So I, I, I congratulate everybody and thank everybody for the, the extra effort that they, they went through and the time spent in the car to get here. We had people traveling as, many, as much as two hours. I'd like to just mention that uh, a neighboring school had a two hour delay in Lexington and my daughter teaches there. Those children arrived, I think, in the worst part of the storm that morning mm -hmm. with that two hour delay. Superintendents, I think, are to be praised. It's a very difficult decision uh, to make. And uh, the information that you had, mm -hmm. you acted upon, I think, justifiably. Mm -hmm. The weatherman didn't prove right, that's it. Can, can I? Mm -hmm. Just ask a question. So I had heard reports of some students at the Audison being told that it was not an excuse tardy or absence when they came on Friday late because of the storm. And I'm just wondering, will you communicate or will, will you discuss with Mr. Ruggieri or how can that? I'm, I'm concerned that there's not a district wide understanding that if this happens, that's what. <coughs> Um, I, I, I certainly will, but I also had sent an email to confirm that students should be able to have to Monday turn homework in, or if they uh, if a quiz what was given that day that they'd be able to make it up. So I, I will certainly check that out. At the high school, in, in, you know, honestly, it doesn't really matter. I don't want to say it that way. There are a certain number of days that students, uh, whether excused or unexcused, have in a term. And should there be a need to go over, it's just a question of going in with an explanation. So on a particular day to say whether it's excused or unexcused is really not that important. And uh, I don't think people understand that because it's really, it's really the totality of absences. And it, even though a field trip, for example, is an excused absence, it still counts toward that bottom line number. And if you, if, if, you know, it's, it happens in students' lives that you may exceed that number and then you just have to then uh, basically talk with administration about a waiver on that. Okay. Ms. Heim. Um, I did appreciate your sharing with us your communication because I did, um, when a lot of superintendents were being second guessed, it very clearly described what the process was. And um, the one thing I'm wondering you could speak to is right now there's a projection that there might be a storm next week on Monday. And um, the <laughs> MCAS long comp is on Tuesday. And um, I know that there are some ramifications if any school in the state closes for the weather on Tuesday in terms of the administration of the MCAS? <laughs> just shift the day? What? Don't you just move the day ahead? Um, I, I, th I don't know the answer to that. There clearly is a, there is a certain level of common sense that has to enter into all of this. And as much as the Department of Education might like to have that sense of con total control over the day that it's administered, uh, that may be a problem. It is true that they want to have it administered on the same day because of the topic that's given, unless people are tweeting all over the state as to what the topic would be. So um, I don't know, that's something that we'll, we'll have to look into. Um, should that become necessary? It could be that if that became a situation where it looked like there'd be a spotty at, you know, school closures, they might just take the whole thing and move it a day statewide. Mm -hmm. Because you can't do it as individual schools. That's they, the problem. They've actually done that before, mm -hmm. um, but a, a lot will depend on which grade is scheduled for Tuesday. If it, mm -hmm. and I mean, there's always a, a, a makeup day. Um, and 10th, 10th grade, there's a long comp makeup day. So if we were for having to cancel school on Tuesday and it was the 10th grade, then there is a makeup day. Mm -hmm. 
So, and those makeup days are always well after snow season. Any other questions? Something to look forward to. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, kindergarten registration, I want to take this opportunity to remind incoming parents that they <coughs> register their children, even if they have other children in the school system, they still need to register. And we've gone now through two weeks of registration, next week is our last week. And, and in fact, we, had a, we were debating today whether we're going to actually have an, a second day, because the second day next week was designed for snow. Um, and next week's day is Tuesday, so th there is a <laughs> <laughs> first day is Tuesday, so uh, it, it's important, and we will also try to get that out. It's it's difficult to get it out to the kindergarten community just because we don't have their email and access. So we've been putting it in the advocate, um, and just try to get that information out to all the preschools. All right, so on. So to how some, how did it go, or how has it been going? Very well. Um, we had, we really designed a pretty good system. The first night there was maybe 10 people waiting, but we, we moved it along in different stations. The thing I think that's been um, an interesting uh, surprise to us is the number of people that, that d had already come in and done a lot of, done it on, on online. We had, we thought we would need a whole computer lab, and at most sometimes we'd have one or two parents in there filling it out online. So the level of, I guess what I'm, I'm saying is that the level of usage uh, using computers for communication is definitely growing to the extent that uh, we've had, I don't think we've even had more than one or two requests from anyone to send out a paper packet. So that's very interesting. I, I can give you more of all of that kind of data um, once registration's over. And then we will be, the, the, we sent out, uh, what's a little concerning at the moment is that we sent out packets of about 465, of which we got back about 25 that were not at the particular, at the, the recipient wasn't at the address that was given. But it, as of today, we only have 303 registered, and we, we're, we're pretty confident that we're going to be looking at over 400 in the kindergarten next year. So this next week is a pivotal week for people to get registered. And for people who live in the buffer zones, things are, are date stamped so that the waiting list, if there's any, uh, if you don't get your first choice, is based on the date stamp and, and lottery among the date stamps. Mr. Um, Hayden. Uh, could I ask you just to reinforce uh, the discussion you and I had about those that are grandfathered in in the buffer zone if you have a sibling already in the school? Yes. If you're already, you're, an older child is already in the school, you are grandfathered. Your family is grandfathered into that school. Thank you very much. During the snowstorm, we had Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> and. The first night it was pretty snowy, but we did move it the second night to Saturday night, and I, that was probably a good decision because it was packed. And I, I just have to congratulate um, all of the students and certainly the adults that helped make this production as great as it was. It was, it was amazing. I don't know if any of you had a chance to see it. The voices and the stage presence of these students was exceptional. So in particular, I want to recognize Jenna Fernandez, who is a sixth grade teacher, who is the director, and uh, Greg Kondakis, Corey Gaffney for music. One was producer, one was the music director, and the choreography was Randy Flynn. Really exceptional. And coming up is Grease at the high school the first weekend in April, 4th and 5th. We had, speaking of music, we had um, <laughs> Our music program is just exceptional, and you know that, the community knows that, but another affirmation of that exceptionalness is that uh, Tina D'Agostino and his AHS Jazz Octet, and he, he decided to go into the Berkeley um, International Jazz Festival with an octet this year, and they won first place. Um, there 
there were different categories um, for instrumental and orchestra and so forth, but he, he entered into the, it was 13 other small combos in this, and of course there's hundreds of people that compete in this uh, international competition. The score for the octet overall was 98 out of 100 points. So they were just, they also won, one, one of our students won the Outstanding Mus Musician Prize and the other the Superior Musician Prize. So it's exceptional. And so congratulations to all these students. And I, I think that article will be in the advocate. We also had another outstanding performance in the National History Day. I don't know if you remember, last year we entered National History competition for the first time. And uh, one of our Odyssey students won first place. So this year, uh, there were a number of entries into, into this, both from the Odyssey Middle School and from the high school. And so they entered the Eastern Mass Regional Competition, and a team both from the high school and from Odyssey are moving on to the states, which will ha be happening in April. And for the Odyssey Middle School, the um, the, what, the category that they were very successful in was original website category. So they're creating websites on a particular topic. And it, for the Odyssey Middle School, the title was The Oxford Meeting Darwin Challenges Creationism. Mm -hmm. And at the high school, the title was The Trial of Peter Zenger, Press Libertarian. No, Liberation. <laughs> Press Liberation. So congratulations to all of them, and, and congratulations um, to their, their advisors. Um, at the Odyssey, it's Allison Sansonito and Jason Levy. And at the high school, advisors were Ian McKay and Amanda Camillo. So we just, uh, we just continue uh, to uh, our students to continue to do very well. And so congratulations to them all, and again, congratulations to their advisors and teachers. That's it. Okay. Actually, so we had, oops. Oh, yes, yes. It's yes. Uh -huh. Yes. The, um, thank you. Um, one of the things, you're all aware, because we've been talking about this for quite a while, there is a new educator evaluation system <coughs> that is going to be part of the reality of school districts across the Commonwealth. Um, some school districts have already b begun, race to the top districts. And even the year before that, where some of our um, uh, uh, some of our um, urban districts. So in Arlington, we have been working this year, and, and I will give a lot of credit to Laura Chesson and to Linda Hansen for organizing a task force that is a very collaborative group of teachers and administrators learning about the new evaluation system, and many of them. Uh, participating in a pilot. Um, there are pilots going on at each one of the schools, in each one of the departments, and, uh, of, a, of a teacher and a principal, and actually in some cases, some principals couldn't say no, and they may be working with eight teachers in a pilot. Um, we have all of the curriculum leaders and assistant principals and principals doing working with w at least one, if not more, teachers in a pilot. So we had talked about the beginning of the year um, that I would be doing a pilot with you. And it, it's, it's really not, I want to separate, it's really not an ev evaluation in the same sense as we've been doing the annual. It's really an opportunity to understand by practicing um, what this looks like, um, understanding the rubrics, understanding what kind of evidence that you, you would use to to, um, to say that you're performing at a proficient level. So what I would like to do is to have us participate in this just as we're doing throughout the whole district because we're gonna, it's a learning experience so that we can see where the, what things we need to do and think about when we actually do a more, uh, next year we move in doing it across the board. So I was proposing that next, what well, we're gonna meet with the, um, I'm going to meet with the curriculum and, and accountability subcommittee before the next meeting to talk about what this would look like 
and then present it next meeting so that we can all practice together in a, a very limited way over the next um, two months. Okay. Cool. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair. Mr. Hainer. Going forward from that, that concept, I would like the committee to consider and be prepared to discuss a timeline for the actual superintendent's evaluation next year prior to us going for summer break so that we can be together in a good position in September to go forward. Just oh. I'm okay. going to an MASC conference on Saturday and uh, it, it's mainly dealing with superintendent evaluation. I've been talking with Dr. Bodie on again, off again. <coughs> we keep coming up with questions that we need clarified before we get into the, the full. Okay. But you're not saying do this at the next meeting? No, no, okay. no. I'm, so, I'm sure. asking people put it in their mind yeah. end of May, beginning yeah. of June. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So at this point, we go on to subcommittee and liaison reports, uh, policy and procedures. Nothing to report. Okay, budget. We have done the budget. Did yes, we and we met. Um, we went over the budget um, and made sure that we were ready for both the finance committee meeting. Uh, again, reminder, it is Wednesday the 20th at 745 and the opening uh, or whenever we get in front of town meeting. Um, so, um, and we felt like we were prepared for all of those, so it was a fairly quick meeting. Um, can I also um, report on Arlington Youth Health Safety Coalition? Sure. It's not on here, but um, it's one of the things that I attend, um, and that is a coalition of groups throughout the town who are focused on uh, keeping our children safe, primarily uh, with drug and alcohol abuse. Um, and this year, they are revamping how that is run and Karen Dillon and I um, will be ch serving as co-chairs for the coming year. Um, her focus is getting high school students involved and my focus is gonna be on parent involvement um, in that and kind of coming together and figuring out how all of those pieces can work together. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Ms. Hyam, uh, Community Relations yeah, Report. Okay. Uh, curriculum instruction and accountability? We met on Monday, March 11th, and we talked about two items that were on the agenda tonight, the uh, formative assessments and the tools of the mind, kindergarten mm -hmm. curriculum. We also uh, heard a, um, uh, a presentation by the Superintendent's Diversity Task Force on some ideas they'd like the superintendent to consider in the FY14 goals. And so Dr. Bodie made note of it and is gonna take it into account as she formulates recommended goals for us for next year. <clears throat> the um, our subcommittee meets again on Monday, March 25th at 5.30 p.m. here in the school committee room to talk about the pilot that Dr. Bodie just talked about and uh, to talk about retail, rethinking, teaching, and English language. Teaching and equity something. and teaching. Equity, equity and teaching for English, for English language, language learners. <laughs> yeah, so there you have it. <laughs> Retail, I thought I had it. So that's going to be on, uh, we, we, we're talking about that, and that's and, the, and Dr. Buddy talked a little bit about the, what that uh, requirement is for our teachers. Okay. Uh, facilities? Nothing on facilities, but I attended the Metco Day at the State House yesterday and uh, spoke to both our rep Representative Gobley, uh, the aide to Representative Rogers, and the aide to uh, Senator Donnelly. Uh, all three are committed to support a level funded budget. Uh, my understanding, uh, they're still looking at the increase that Metco itself has asked, but uh, hopefully the good news is we'll at least have the level funded budget. Okay. It was a Thank wonderful you. day. Okay, legal services will be meeting next in the next two weeks, I hope. We, we have to schedule. And then as chair, um, again, I give the notice to everyone that you need to submit your willingness to serve, and I would point out that right now you're missing a secretary you said you would do it. I, that was not <laughs> intended. That's what it says. You I said know, you that was not, I, I. <laughs> Too late, you wrote it down. It says right, right on there, there. I got it. Yeah. I know, you said you would do anything we elected you. have such good fun the past year. Oh, God. <laughs> what you're saying is okay. you'd like someone else to put forward that they Yes, would I would like someone else to put forward. I am going to withdraw <laughs> my name. Okay, so. Or else, we volunteer you. <laughs> <laughs> They're not um, jumping out of the woodwork. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate 
separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so request in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence approval of warrant number 13127 dated february 28th 2013 total warrant amount seven hundred seventy three thousand nine hundred sixty fifty six dollars and forty seven cents minutes for approval february 14th 2013. so move second all in favor aye, aye. any opposed no Okay, and secretary's report, Ms. Hyde? There's nothing to report this evening. Oh, okay. At this point, we I need a motion to re-enter executive session. She got us right back on track. So moved. Second. Um, Do we, we need to reread it, right? We will. Yes, uh, we'll reread it. Yeah, I'll reread it. To conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiation with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be continued. Update on superintendent contract negotiations. Kathleen Bodie, uh, superintendent and we will be exiting only for the purposes of adjournment. Motion? We already moved in. Second. Oh, okay. Mr. Schlickman? Aye. 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 We now go into executive session. With a late start, we finished yeah. on the button. Picked it right Congratulations. Good job, Kirsten. is amazing. <laughs> Madam Madam doctor, doctor chair. chair. You don't double them up. Take one. Doctor, Madam chair. Take one. Doctor, Madam. So, Doctor, Madam. <laughs> just, thank you for coming. You're, You're good. Nice. It'll be the commended. Thank you. First one to stay the whole week. <laughs> thank you. Did you know you could sneak? <laughs> oh, actually, Diane, I need to talk. Thank to you. Thank you. Sure. You can do whatever you like with them. They're souvenirs you, of if, your wonderful If you leave experience. them there, they will okay. be ready for you. How's that? <laughs> I'll end up less than what I wrote down. They make really good paper airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, you're talking from experience. No, 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 never. <laughs> First, <laughs> dump them on your feet. What can I say? I mean, that's just the way it is. So.